Hello, hopefully you can hear me this time. Um, welcome back, I am making my uh, second video. Um, this time I will be talking about uh, Charles Ferdinand Latrille Comte de Laurenti, a uh, uh, un relatively forgotten general in the uh, 19th century under, uh, under uh, Napoleon III's uh, empire. Uh, yeah, this is part of uh, the French history I was talking about. And I'm very fascinated in this. Um, he, Laurence is one of the famous, um, one of the generals who is, whose career has taken a really, you know, it's very interesting because most people right now these days know him for the for his you know role in the Battle of Puebla, right? But people forget, you know, his career before the the battle and you know even afterwards because he did went go on to lead a um, sort of successful comeback but no one really cares. He pretty much still gets, um, you know, just hammered on that battle. And there's some merit to that, but, you know, yeah. So uh, let's get started. Um, yeah. So Charles Ferdinand, he was born in 1814 uh, to uh, Guillaume Latria de Laurence, who was a, a famous general slash more like an officer in the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, Caroline uh, Nicolette Udino de Reggio, who was the daughter of Marshal Udino. So making it makes uh, Ferdinand the young uh, grandson of Marshal Udino, who was the, a famous marshal in uh, Napoleon's Grand Armée. So he chooses to go into his father's footsteps in the military, and he goes to uh, Saint Cyr, which is a famous, prestigious military school in France. And he uh, uh, comes out as a sous lieutenant which is like a junior officer still in training, but he's allowed to take uh, control of a battalion at just age 18. At this time, in order to see combat with the French army, the most uh, French people, French soldiers would usually go to Algeria because the French are were co currently conquering Algeria, but it was more like a uh, battle of, of control because the Algerians used guerrilla tactics and were a lot of tribes who um, sometimes grew like large enough armies to crush field armies of France. So it was conventional and unique. So the way France uh, deals with the Algerians is suppression through um, brutality, massacres, and uh, scorched earth tactics to sort of, you know, um, knock down the Algerians will to live or I mean <laughs> to fight. So Lawrence comes into uh, Algeria at the head of light infantry, the uh, third chasseurs at Pied, which uh, tells you that he, it was more of a speed and you know maneuvering on the battlefield kind of thing. But as we will see, uh, Lawrence's task was to help a um, who was this guy a uh, lieutenant colonel uh, Pelissier in you know suppressing the Algerians. Now it's key to note that you know most of his career in Algeria is kind of unknown because not really there's not a lot of uh, documentation on all the French armies and forces. Uh, but there are two accounts that I uh, think is key to uh, note. First off, in 1845 is the uh, Daffer Cave massacre when uh, in a uh, when French forces uh, Lawrence was in this force with his battalion under a uh, policier, this colonel, lieutenant colonel, colonel, whatever, that he basically tried to smoke out some Algerians, their families, their children in, in a cave, in the Daffer Caves, but they did, they just suffocated to death. And this became a huge scandal in France because the French, although they are basically, you know, massacring a lot of Algerians in the war, they try to, you know, see themselves as a more of a civilizing force, but eh, not so much. And somehow, somehow, Plessier, because he later uh, doubled down on what on what he was trying to do, and he says that even though this was a massacre, it, you know, it was necessary, you know. Somehow he becomes a French a French marshal later on, so that's good. Well, and also for Laurent in 1849, his uh his uh, major thing deed in the uh in the war is that he helps uh, end a bloody siege revolt. Depends on um, how you see it, because in French sources, it's a siege, but in English, it's more of a revolt. Both have merits because it's very bloody. This uh, revolt in the city of a uh, town of a uh, Zacha. I don't know. 
But Laurent is uh, commands a battalion, this time of Zouaves, who are a pro-French Algerian uh, tribesmen, and who are really the first of many uh, colonial troops that France will rely on in their uh, adventures uh, abroad. And, uh, you know, just fun fun note, he was under, uh, in this battle, he was leading the battalion, uh, Laurence, under uh, Colonel Corombert, a future marshal. And it's also here to note that the Zouaves help, uh, they help uh, lead the success at Zatcha. So. Why do I mention this, this whole uh, adventure in Algeria? Well, it tells you that it took like roughly over a decade of uh, Laurence's life to, you know, help fight the uh, Algerians. And he will come back in France in 1852 as a colonel commanding some, uh, you know, light infantry, line infantry. But in 1855, his father passes away and Ferdinand officially adopts uh, his, his dad's titles, uh, Laurence, Comte de Laurence, and his, you know, states. Also, can you know, in 1852, the uh, French Republic uh, is overthrown by a Napoleon III, uh, I think Louis Napoleon, and with, and begins the reign of uh, the Second French Empire. But Laurence is kind of indifferent. Like most of the French armies in this war are indifferent. No one really revolts. And Laurence will be a he will be a faithful Bonapartist, you know, because frankly he hasn't gone that much. It's just a change of the head of the state, but it won't affect him that much. And but Napoleon the Third, he has major plans for uh, France, and one of his first acts in his early reign will, uh, in this case, in Laurence's, you know, that will affect Laurence. He will lead France into the Crimean War, but. Uh, Laurence will not join t- until like 1855, uh, which is, you know, in the middle of it, but it's kind of late in the war. Um, the Crimean War is very complex, but it's generally a Britain, the Ottoman Empire, and France against Russia. I forgot to mention our Sardinia, but eh, so-so. And the main theater war was in the Crimea. And it was mainly the siege of Sevastopol, which was uh, the main, the biggest, most important city in the Crimea, in the south of uh, Russia. And Laurence comes uh, late in the war, but as a general of brigade. Key to note that a brigade is half a division. So Laurence is commanding a lot of men here, half a division. And it's key to note, key to note that a French corps, which is like a mini army in itself, is two or three divisions, and just can you note that in this case, uh, Laurence, he's getting up there in the French ranks, so just keep note on that. But uh, he comes out the, freaking he comes out uh, during uh, France's main battle in the Crimean War, which is, in my opinion, the siege, of, the battle of uh, the Malakoff uh, Redoubt, and it's one of the keys to securing the the siege's end of Sevastopol. Now Laurence is a uh, Brigade, they fight at Malakoff, but in this part of the battle, um, in this section of the battlefield, his brigade and others are pushed back by the Russians. Not his fault, but, you know, because the Russians are fierce, they are in um, very built up defenses. But in the other French attacks, they succeed, and Malakoff falls, and Laurence is wounded in battle, but he will return to France kind of like as a you know, kind of like a hero. And he will mainly, he will become, become a favored and, you know, recognized by Napoleon. Now, we're leading up to uh, the uh, French expedition, but let us uh, note that France was at the, the zenith of its prestige and reputation since, in my opinion, once again, since the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon III uh, continues to build upon the, uh, their prestige by going to, you know, wars with Austria with their uh, help with their ally uh, Sardinia or you know the Italians for new lands and glory um but in order to really uh, get um some allies abroad uh it's so it just so happens that the Americans get into a civil war and because they're in a civil war they can't interfere with uh they can't enforce their Muron doctrine which is basically a warning to other you know European uh <clears throat> European uh, powers to stay out of uh, the Americas, you know, don't colonize it, you know, just let it be. And pretty much in, uh, yeah. 
So Napoleon uh, decides to use that, you know, that time with when the Americans are busy to uh, invade, uh, invade and conquer Mexico. It needs a plan, though, like any uh, excuse. It's just what happens that Mexico has emerged from many civil wars where its liberal uh, establishment have uh, def- recently defeated the conservative factions, but the conservatives are still fighting in the field in, um, in uh, many guerrilla wars of their own. So they have, so the French have uh, potential allies in the field to help them. And it just so happens that during these civil wars, Mexico has asked for a lot of money, a lot of, uh, from, you know, from Spain and Britain as well. So France uh, talks with those uh, nations and they both agree to an international intervention to just force Mexico to repay its uh, money because it stopped paying its money because of um, the economy was basically gar- garbage by the time it finished its civil war. So the president there, uh, Juarez, he canceled all the debts to you know get the economy back together, but it just it, uh, makes the other powers uh, pretty much uh, pissed off. But France will uh, send... Uh, even though they're part of the you know international intervention, they'll secretly send plans to uh you know turn this into uh intervention into an invasion. So let me drink some uh, some water. Now I kind of skipped over a lot of things, but what generally happens in the expedition intervention in the uh, intervention, uh, Britain and Spain uh, kind of. They kind of realized that Mexico is not in a good state to repay money, so they agreed to wait. But France already sent a uh, they sent uh, Napoleon sends Lorenzo now uh, as a general of a division with six thousand to six and a half hundred you know men to the city of Veracruz or the coast around that city because he gets orders to uh, uh, basically cause negotiations to crash with Mexico and to cause a precursor to war with the Mexicans. Um, Spain and Britain, uh, they leave. It's key to note that uh, Britain is France's kind of main, main, uh, it's France's recent fighting ally and they've, they've generally had favorable, you know, um, relations, but just note that the expedition ruins, ruins all that, you know? And uh, Queen Victoria, I think she says she wants nothing to do with uh, nothing to do with this, you know, this guy, Napoleon. But Laurence comes in, he protects, quote unquote, protects French soldiers. I forget how, but he forces a skirmish to happen, and uh, he pushes out the Mexican forces from the Veracruz area, and he establishes establishes uh, a base in Orizaba, which is a uh, town near uh, Veracruz. And the Mexicans are pushed out to uh, inner, to the inner lands, right? And the Kemeni army of the east is under General Lorenzo, who will be the main um, player in uh, the expedition. At the Alcuzingo Pass, which is a uh, pretty much a uh, a pass, a pass uh, the main pass blocking the uh, French from going inside Mexico into inner Mexico, he. Uh, it's unclear what happens. Laurence, he, it's not, it's more like a skirmish, but Laurence's uh, men take the high ground. The Zouavs take the high ground. Can you note that in uh, Laurence's army, it's full of uh, Zouavs. So it's not really a French army, but more of a French colonial army. Uh, Laurence, you could say he pushes out uh, the Mexicans from the high ground from the past, but there's other like uh, reports that the Mexicans kind of abandoned uh, the the heights because uh, Zaragoza didn't. He knew that against the French in open fields, in open ground, they wouldn't have a chance to defeat the French. So he pull, he might have pulled back. But whatever the case, uh, we want to take the pass. I forgot to m- mention this, but it's really after this. It's uh after this battle, which he uh, gives his famous uh, quote to uh, the Minister of War back in Paris, where he says something around the lines of, um, we are so superior to the Mexicans uh, in terms of training, equipment, race, that you can go tell the uh, emperor that I am the master of Mexico. It's a pretty bold word. So you can see that Lorenzo did not think a lot of the Mexican forces. So he's overconfident and that will cost him dearly. 
So he uh, takes his army and drives into Mexico, Alaranzi. And what happens is the famous Battle of Puebla. So Lorenzo uh, chases down Lorenzo's army into a uh, to the town of Puebla. He expects to meet um, conservatives in the area, but unbeknownst to him, Laurent, uh, Zaragoza sends a force to cut them off, so they won't arrive until very late. Or I think he cuts them off. I don't know. Um, he slows them down enough. So, so Lorenzo's battle on Puebla. He plans to attack the northern forts of Puebla, which is kind of dumb in our in retrospect, but other officers would later say that what Laurenti does is kind of pretty much what a general looking for a victorious battle would have done. Never, nevertheless, it fails due to uh, poor tactics, that overconfidence I mentioned ago, and pretty much low supplies. In this case, it's mainly the artillery. It's also getting to note that Laurent he becomes favored with the uh, with Napoleon, but it's also key to note that he is now the head of a division, and he's a very a high ranking a high ranking general. He's Napoleon's man in Mexico. By losing the Battle of Puebla, Laurent he loses pretty much his only chance to earn a marshal's marshal's baton, and yeah, his army is repulsed. They're not really crushed or defeated outright. They're just repulsed. But his army is forced from the field. But sort of like what happens at Gettysburg, like after the battle, Lawrence sets up his, his defeated army expecting a counterattack, but Zaragoza holds his ground because, you know, going back, he knows that he can't defeat the French. So Lawrence is forced to retreat later on. The battle is not very uh, decisive, it's debatable whether it's a major victory. I guess in the year 1862, it's a major victory because the French are repulsed. But nevertheless, but you know, an overall expedition, the French will return. The French are not crushed or you know broken at Puebla. They're just pushed back. Nevertheless, it will be a huge morale boost for Metzko and gives it more time to mobilize its forces. And this is basically where the... Uh, Many historians choose to, you know, just abandon uh, whatever case on uh, Lorenzi. People don't really talk about the aftermath, his later career. They just say, oh, he just lost to Puebla. But there's still more to, the, to these slides, so let's continue. So what happens after the battle, the retreat? Well, Lorenzi is beaten at Puebla but not crushed. His army is pursued by Zergos's men who are... Uh, Pretty much, he's trying to, Zergos is trying to, you know, use his victory and, you know, exploit it. However, the French army is pretty, it's still the best army in the world, uh, the French army, you know. So when Laurent orders a rear guard to, you know, hold back the Mexicans, they uh, clash with the Mexican vanguard at uh, Barranca Seca, and they win a really crushing victory because I for, I don't know how many casualties, but it's a lot. And it's partly due because at Barranca Seca, the rear guard is finally joined by the conservatives, you know, just a little bit too late. And they crush their rear guard. And it's so crushing that it ruins Zaragoza's momentum. And he forced, and it forces uh, Zaragoza to, um, to wait for reinforcements to come under General Ortega. However, this is also where Zaragoza's story comes to an end because he dies from disease, I think yellow fever. And yeah, he uh, it's really it's it's because in the in the region where uh, Lawrence and Zaragoza were fighting, that area of Mexico to the coast um, around Veracruz, it was very uh, prone to yellow yellow fever. I think I don't know if Zaragoza gets it, but Lawrence does. He'll later die from it. Going back to uh, going back to General Ortega, he arrives with reinforcements, and because Zaragoza is dead, he takes overall command of the Army of the East. It can, continues where uh, Zergosa left off. He pursues uh, Lorenzo back to Orizaba and begins the siege over Orizaba, which is, in my opinion, very highly, you know, you there's no reports on Orizaba's sieges. You know, there's no report on a siege. It is, in my opinion, one of the... Um, it should be a very documented siege because... You know, 
it was the aftermath of Puebla, you know, but somehow French and Mexican sources just abandoned it, you know. French sources only mention it because the uh, the heights, the Battle of um, or yeah, the Battle of a uh, Zero del Borrego. It's really uh when the French, some French forces take the heights where the Mexicans place their cannons for the siege. They take the heights, take the guns, and it makes the siege like too hard and to the point of useless and impossible to continue, and it raises the siege. And it's a huge morale boost in French forces, kind of like a uh, redemption of Puebla. And Ortega later uh, retreats back to Inner Mexico. He'll be later present in the siege of Puebla. So, nevertheless, throughout this whole retreat right here, uh, Laurenti is very undermentioned. He just, the only thing they mention is that, oh, he orders a rear guard right here. He orders a rear guard. That's it. So the retreat is very success, successful, but in my opinion, it's due more to these uh, organization, leadership, and uh, skill of the French army itself rather than its commanding chief, Laurence. And nevertheless, uh, Napoleon sends uh, reinforcements under General uh, Faure to take over where Laurence failed. Uh, Laurence wants to keep command of his men and keep fighting, but Napoleon he sends them back to France in December. He you know that uh, Foray uh, went his baton later down the expedition. So Laurence pretty much is he Laurence pretty much loses his only chance to uh, get a baton. So back in France, uh, it's pretty much for seven years. It's a year dis- dis- it's years of disgrace. Laurence never returns to Mexico, and he basically goes uh, he bickers about it. He keeps telling Napoleon to you know, pull out troops and warns of a potential disaster. And he just tries to dis- dissuade Napoleon of a idea of a pro-French regime in Mexico, which is uh, kind of credible, but he, Laurence, Laurence, he he just says this stuff, but in reality, he what he was saying was kind of right about the uh, idea of a pro-French regime not being liked in Mexico, you know? He also fights his, he will fight for his uh, damaged reputation at Puebla for the rest of his life. Uh, meanwhile, the French, ex- the Mexican expedition uh, later ends in a French withdrawal with, um, with French forces being, uh, you know, uh, they get uh, supervised to withdraw and intact. And, you know, by who? Uh, well, it's one of, uh, by Mar- one of um, France's new marshals who got his baton in Mexico. Marshal Bizane. We'll talk about him later. He can, he's a uh, part of Laurence's, you know, career as well. In 1866, uh, he gets uh, Laurence gets his uh, grand officer, um, grand uh, he gets uh, made um, grand uh, officer de la Legion d'honneur, but it pretty much is nothing. It's like a you know a look cute thing, you know. But he's an expect he's basically just an it's inspector general for a. Uh, up to the Franco-Prussian War, which is pretty much uh, the main war and for the, uh, it's a big war. The Franco-Prussian War is a very big war and France begins to mobilize for an invasion of uh, German, Germany and their, uh, for Prussia and their uh, German state, uh, German allies. And because the war, the war is so near to France, they will mobilize a lot of men this time, far more than the uh, Crimean War. I think. But in 1870, uh, Laurence is uh, back in command, but only of a garrison in Toulouse. However, for some reason, either if either uh, because the army knew that they needed experienced generals, Napoleon had a change of heart, whatever, Laurence is given a, a command of a division again. But this time it's part of 4th Corps. It's key to note that 4th uh, Corps is part of the Army of the Rhine which means it has actual French people being soldiers. So it might it might have been smaller than uh, Laurence's army in Mexico, but because of the war, we don't know. It might have been as maybe bigger, but it's very better equipped than the Mexican army. Um, Fourth Corps, uh, note that it's very, um, it's only there to secure a, a lifeline back to France, for back to Paris for the emperor. Fourth Corps is stationary. It just, dis- Secures the rear guard. That's it. It's under the command of um, General uh, 
La de Miro, uh, La Miro, I don't know. But um, I forgot to mention this, but uh, La Miro, uh, he thinks of Laurent's uh, division as a stationary division, so he won't do much. Laurent's division is more used for as a reserve, that's what I'm saying. But um, the French incursions fail. The Prussians begin their counteroffensive, and Fourth Corps uh, and pretty much the whole army of the Rhine falls under the command of Marshal Bizing around the fortress city in Metz. And the Prussians, at this in this point, they try to uh, surround those armies under Bizing and to a, like to a besiege and annihilate them. So let me get my water again. So Bizane gets his armies. <clears throat> they are on the east of Metz, east east of Metz, and around the city of a uh, of Borny right here. Uh, the Prussian doctrine in wars were to have uh, to let their officers have a lot of initiative, you know, independent minds in the wars, right? And in this case, a Prussian officer or a general, whatever, he decides to attack the French armies. And by doing that, he gets his um, his uh, comrades to help him. And the French have to, you know, because they see the Prussians, you know, this lone Prussian guy attacking them, they have to attack or defend themselves. So this is a pitched battle where neither army, you know, really planned to fight at. It is a battle more between the French rear guards and the Prussian vanguards. Can you note that in this case, even though it's a skirmish or a mini battle, it is this unknown battle. It's bigger than the battle of the Malakoff in the in you know in Laurence's early career. And in my opinion, this is where Laurence surprisingly you know does his best, performs at his best. You know, a forgotten general doing his best in a forgotten battle. So as I said, he's used as a uh, and his core his division is used as a rear as a. <clears throat> reinforcements and he initially helps secure the french uh, left flank left wing and he helps launch the french counterattack on that section and takes back a newly and he doesn't break the uh, prussian's uh, right wing but he stretches it a lot longer right and it's such a serious uh, threat that the prussians they can't continue their attacks on the center of the the left wing because they might be the french might crash into their uh, right wing and, and, you know, crush them. So the Prussians pull back. It's key to note that in this, in this battle, this is another uh, a battle where, uh, this is a battle where uh, Marshal Bizane, he could have pressed his attack and ordered a general, uh, you know, push in his more reserves to counterattack the Prussians and break out to the east, perhaps, ruin the lines of communications with the Prussians, but he does not. He keeps his armies in, uh, intact. He does not use his uh his um uh, reserves like the Imperial Guard. He le he later brags to a point about you know keeping his his reserves unused. But uh, yes, he will stay near Metz. He will pull back, continue his retreat towards Metz. But because of the battle, he'll be severely uh he won't be uh his movements are going to be very uh slow. It's now it's key, you know, talk time to talk about his leadership busy. He is put in charge of the army of the Rhine, but as a marshal, he's in my opinion, he's one of the most um overrated marshals. No, no, over promoted marshals. He is very aggressive. He is uh more of a, a frontline battlefield general than actual actual strategic guy, you know. And he was very cautious when he's facing the Prussians. He always kept his reserves on use and his movements were very slow due to uh, bickering with his army staff. Because Bizane, uh, he was in charge, but he always had faith in uh, Metz, the fortress city. And he kind of represented what the French kind of, you know, uh, what their weakness in the, in the war was, which was to rely on pure defense stage battles where they would annihilate the Prussians with their uh, mitrailleuse uh, machine guns, you know. 
but in doing so, they would lose the initiative potentially to the Prussians, which they took and and pretty much won with every time. You know, two days after the Battle of Borny, Bazin uh, met the Prussians again at the Battle of Mars the Tor. It is considered the last great opportunity for Bazin to break out from Metz to the west to link up with Napoleon III and his um, other marshal, Macmal. But because he held the advantage in the morning, he outnumbered the Prussians, you know. But I think Bazin was, what was he doing? What was he doing? He was, um, <clears throat> might be on the front lines or whatever. Whatever the case, he did not press on his, you know, uh, superior superiority in numbers very he didn't press him press them too much and he blundered the battle and the prussians uh pre- pretty much beat him back they got reinforcements and beat him back and he was forced to retreat back to metz to to the north laurent's division tried to help the french at uh, marsator but the french had a lot of chaotic movements to move from east of metz to the southwest of metz so he was too late to the battlefield, but because uh, Laurent is ending up, uh, no, because Bazin retreats north, his army, uh, Biz, uh, Laurent's uh, division is in the right place to uh, be in the next great battle, of the war, which was uh, in the south of Saint Privat. It's also the, the the biggest battle of the war, Gravelot. Gravelot is the French are. Defending basically, this that's it. They were defending the south of Saint Privat, which is a little town, and north of uh, Gravelot, I think maybe northwest of Gravelot. I don't know. It's a line between those two towns. Uh, Laurent's uh, division is uh, in the right in the middle of it. He's defending the very center wing of uh, the line at a uh, at the town of uh, Amanville. Amanville, Amanville, I don't know. He's defending in the very middle of the the French battle with with Fourth Corps, and he does really good. Uh, he defends his position and repulses the Prussians from taking the main railways multiple times due to his uh, use of the mitrailleuse gun. This is one of the battles where the Prussians will take a lot of casualties because the French, their doctrine have made them very used to, uh, well-prepared to defend rather than attack. However, I would argue that this battle has another opportunity for uh, Bizain to win, you know, because the French are attacked um, all over the fronts. They repulse every Prussian, you know, attacks. But I think it's more to the north where, um, by saint Priva, that's on the right wing, the French army, um, the French repulse the uh, Prussians. And the Prussians are pretty worn out and they are weakened, I think. And the French have the numbers to, you know, pursue the Prussians and to really turn the battlefield before reinforcements, you know, come back, you know, they before they uh, come. But Bezin, you know, he does not order a general counterattack with his superiority in numbers there. And he leaves the Prussians to get reinforcements and in this case, it's the Prussian guards and also to set up their uh, Krupp cannons, which make, you know, any French attack, you know, and defense pretty much impossible to conduct. And the right wing by saint Privat is broken and it forces the bat- all the French forces to pretty much retreat in, uh, in a frenzy. And in this chaotic retreat, Laurent is captured and made prisoner of war. The, French, the rest of the French armies uh, will be besieged, bes- uh, besieged at uh, Metz, but that's another story. And in, but they will, you know, all surrender later on. But Laurent's, you know, time in the war is over. So now Laurent is uh, released on uh, before the armistice, after the armistice with Prussia is signed. But the French armies are pretty much not in existence, you know. The empire is overthrown, and the uh, the re- the what is this? The third republic of France is born, and they have to basically rebuild France from uh, where they got, where they you know are left with. However, Laurent is very old by this time, and he retires just two years two years later. 
and in 1885, uh, he he buys the Chateau de, uh, Chateau de Las, where he spends the last years of his life still trying to, you know, fight for his defeat at uh, Puebla. And he dies in a, either uh, 1892 or 1894. Does he re- it doesn't really matter. He's very old and, you know, rip. And yeah, that's the end of uh, Laurence's life. Now, Laurenti as a general, it's a very mixed uh, ranking. I think he gets too much flack for his defeat at Puebla. But I will say that Puebla, Laurenti did blunder the battle. I would, love to talk, I would love to talk about it more in detail, but his overconfidence as a uh, senior commander shows why, you know, he's not fit for that command. However, it's overshadowed by the whole uh, defeat there because he did really good. At the Malkoff, he showed that he had uh, ambition and really a drive to keep attacking. And even though he was repulsed to French, they did give the Russians at Malkoff a really good beating. And the fact that Laurence was managed to get the uh, command of a division, this is really the most interesting thing to me, that the fact he got the chance to res- uh, distinguish himself again because I, you would think that with a garrison at Toulouse, he would stay there, Laurence, but I would really love to know how he got the, the command, you know, of a division at a, with the Army of the Rhine. How, I don't know. There's really nothing, no documents to talk about with the Laurence. But, you know, yeah, he was not really a skilled independent command. Or, but he was really better of a as a subordinate general, and he was, you know. But unfortunately, this is key in my opinion. His commanders were not that better, you know. His, you know, command commanding general, um, what was his name? Uh, La, uh, Lamigo. I don't know the guy of Fourth Corps, General Fourth Corps. He put Laurence's uh division as a reserve, but. I get, with his with his age, because he was very old by the time he got to the Crimean War, uh, I guess that's well needed. But mainly, Bazaine sucked as a marshal. You know, he blundered a lot of battles, and because he lost so many battles, it meant that Laurence could not really see more actions in pursuing the Prussians rather than defending it. You know, once again, I say that Borny shows that Laurence's uh, role in the battlefield could show that. He does have some, uh, you know, use in a battlefield, and he was actually in that he's actually a, a skilled commander because he was trained. He was trained in a uh, military school. He used the, his use of the uh, mitrailleuse guns at a uh, Gravelot shows that Laurence is very, you know, good for defense. So, and the fact that he his army was, in my opinion, better than his Mexican army, and that. Uh, it was like in the, it, it was in a greater war compared to you know the dumb expedition Mexico. It shows that Lorenzo did have uh he did well after Puebla yes, and in my opinion I think it's more because of his age, mellowing out his uh, ignorance and overconfidence. And yeah, in my opinion Lorenzo is a decent general, but he's not. I wouldn't give him command of a whole whole army, you know. He's good at as a subordinate, so he after about it, he pretty much uh, blundered at Puebla, but he did, in my opinion, redeem himself with his actions at Borny and at Graflot, you know. And I think he might have learned his. Uh, he might have known where he laid as as a general with the uh, French army, so because he accepted his role as a uh, reserve division and you know he did really good so yeah so that is the life and story of uh, uh Ferdinand Latrille Comte de Laurence his career is very underrated and undershadowed and I don't know why you know one one day he's the head of an army in Mexico with the top of the world and now the next one he's like completely forgotten so I think he should be he should be given more respect as a general, as a human being. I uh, 
well, spoiler alert, um, I am Mexican, so I do don't those comments about the superiority and race to, of the to the Mexicans, uh, yeah, but that's kind of you know common with most Europeans who consider themselves uh pure in a sense to other races, but yeah, that is Charles of Ferdinand La Tria de Comte de He's very interesting. Uh, he's pretty much the only reason I care about the French in this time because his career is very f- fascinating. I hope to do one day more, um, emphasize more on the Battle of Puebla or perhaps the uh, expedition as a whole, you know. But in regards to the French, uh, I really don't see anything, any more videos with them that much other than, you know, maybe other people. But yeah. So thanks for watching and, um, I hope to um, to do more videos on the future. I might do a video on the Santana or uh, what was the other guy? Um, uh, Porfirio Diaz, you know, because they are very interesting. I hope to also do a video on the uh, revolution in Mexico, Mexican revolution. Though there's a lot of good stories in the 19th century, right? In Mexico, but you know, people forget, don't care, you know, and that's why I want to emphasize. So, yeah. So see you guys next time and uh, goodbye.